Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all this evening uh, and begin with the acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which the University at Melbourne stands. And I'd like to pay respects to their elders, both past and present of the Kulin Nation, and extend that respect to any Indigenous Australians who are here this evening. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Stephen Wilkinson from Yale University to give this the second in our Keywords for India flagship lecture series. Stephen Wilkinson is Nilakani Professor of India and South Asian Studies and the Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at Yale University. He also chairs the Political Science Department at Yale. I've known Stephen for I suppose about 15 years, and got to know his work through uh, the superb research he was doing in the early 2000s on the nature and causes of ethnic violence, which culminated in his book, his award-winning, multiple award-winning book, Votes and Violence, Electoral Competition and Ethnic Rights in India, which was published with Cambridge University Press in 2004. Stephen's also interested in corruption in politics, and he's co-edited a book called Patrons, Clients, or Politics, Patterns of Political Accountability and Competition, which came out with Cambridge three years later in 2007 with Herbert Kitschelt. His most recent book, very recently out, is uh, titled Army and Nation with Harvard University Press, and it examines India's success in managing the colonial army since 1947. He's currently working with Sumatra Jha, on a book on war and political change, the first part of which is on the role of veterans in the partition of India. And this was published, uh, the first part of that project was published in December to, uh, 2012 in the American Political Science Review. The next part of this project looks at the role of returned veterans from the American War of Independence in the French Revolution. It gives you a sense of the breadth and interdisciplinary nature of Stephen's work, which is something that's consistently impressed me about his, uh, his research and interests um, over the last 15 years. This evening, Stephen's been kind enough to, to fly from Yale to talk to us about the topic of equality in India. And as in the case of other key words, uh, Stephen's going to use uh, an examination of the, the meanings of equality to open up an understanding of some of the key challenges facing contemporary India. I'm absolutely thrilled, Stephen, that you could take time out of your schedule to come to Australia. He's also going to be visiting ANU and UNSW later this week, but particularly keen that you could be one of our speakers in the Keyword series. So without um, any further comment, I'd like to invite you to take the stage. Thanks. All right. Um, well, thank you uh, very much for having me here. Uh, it's my first time in Australia, so it's, uh, it's especially nice uh, to see old friends and to, and to get to see Australia for the first time. Um, I realized when I, when I said that I was going to do this uh, talk on keywords, Craig and I discussed several different concepts that we could do. And as I started thinking more about equality, uh, and I'd always been interested in caste equality and especially inter religious relations and minority uh, relations in India, that I was going to need a lot more than just one uh, keyword or um, one or two keywords, that this is really a vast topic. And so I'm going to try and be as comprehensive as I uh, can in providing an introduction to some of the issues that um, India faces, even as I recognize that uh, there are various kinds of equality that I could be touching on that I'm not going to be able to get to. <laughs> All right, so um, first thing I want to say is that um, the commitment to equality, to trying to undo the inequalities that existed within um, Indian society, was absolutely central to the nationalist uh, project. Um, on the left here, you've got Prime Minister Nehru giving his famous Trist with uh, Destiny speech, uh, 
uh, on August the 14th, 1947, in the run-up uh, to midnight. And he made a point of saying that one of the main goals of independence was the ending of poverty and ignorance and disease and inequality of opportunity. And this was something that was consistent with various Congress uh, mobilizational campaigns, public statements, pronouncements, discussions in the preceding few decades. On the right here, you've got a picture of the famous uh, Champaran uh, movement uh, where Congress uh, and Mahatma Gandhi interceded on behalf of the very oppressed indigo farmers in Bihar and Bengal who were living under really very oppressive circumstances. In the 1930s, the Congress made the ending of uh, untouchability a central part of its project. Uh, many of you will be familiar with uh, the marches uh, on salt tax, various other uh, campaigns that were begun to try and make a statement that Congress was on the side of the oppressed, it was on the side of the poor, it was interested in making India a more equal uh, society. And the scale of the, trans of the uh, challenge that um, Congress had in 1947 was absolutely uh, huge. These are two pictures taken by the famous American photographer Margaret Bourke White in 1947. On the left you have uh, a Paka well, uh, a well constructed uh, well in a village and on the right you have the Kacha well that the, uh, the Dalits, the uh, ex-untouchables had to use on the outskirts uh, of the village because they could not use the main uh, well. Literacy in 1947 was extremely low in India, only 15% overall. Male literacy almost five times as high as uh, female literacy. Uh, some castes, very developed castes, uh, upper castes, had literacy rates of 50, 60% or more, whereas poor castes, the poorest, lowest castes, had literacy rates 1, 2%. Uh, some regions of India, like the princely state of Cochin, had literacy rates uh, on average around 30%, whereas other regions, like the princely states in central India, had literacy rates of 1, 2%. So enormous differences. 50 to 70, 50, 70% of men, even at this time, worked in something that was close to their traditional caste occupations confined by birth to a particular uh, job and station in life. So that's just to give you some sense of the challenge that the new country had in 1947. Uh, and one point I want to make is that this uh, inequality was not just incidental to the colonial state, but was a deliberate act of policy sustained by the colonial state. So the colonial state, in terms of granting political power, in its taxation policy, in its recruitment to the civil service, the army, the police, um, made some groups winners and other groups uh, losers. Some regions winners, other groups um, losers. If you were living in um, Bengal, you were taxed at a much higher rate than you were if you lived in Punjab. If you were an upper caste Jat or a Rajput, um, you would um, be given preferential recruitment uh, to the army. Whereas if you were a member of a lower caste, you would be discriminated against and not allowed to join the army. So in multiple ways, the colonial state advantaged some groups and disadvantaged uh, others and produced some of the inequality that we see. And it's useful to remember that, uh, not just in the Indian context, but elsewhere as well, which is why I've put this um, book title up by a political scientist, Ira Katz-Nelson uh, at Columbia University, um, he was interested in the debate on affirmative action in the US and he noticed that a lot of people tended to act as if the state had never been preferential in any way until uh, recently the state started introducing affirmative action that benefited minority groups in the US. And he pointed out, look, in the 1920s, the 1930s, 40s, 50s, many of these great society programs uh, that came out of the Depression uh, benefited whites. Uh, rather than other groups. And similarly, in the Indian context, you had a state that benefited some groups and made other groups losers. In the state of, uh, in the province at that time of Bihar in 1937, there were around 15,000 uh, policemen. Uh, nine of them were scheduled castes. 
Um, you know, that just gives you some sense of the way in which these state recruitment policies created advantage or disadvantage. Um, there was a fierce debate amongst nationalists uh, of different stripes prior to independence on what kind of policies would be appropriate to deal with these uh, inequalities in India. On the one hand, you had uh, people like Muhammad Ali Jinnah, um, the leader of, or one, one of the main leaders, and eventually the leader of the Muslim community, uh, Baldev Singh um, from the Sikh community, uh, and uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, uh, the leader of the, um, the Dalit community, the untouchable community uh, at the time. And these people argued that you can't undo discrimination by making everyone equal. You need to provide uh, particular kinds of group-specific policies, political representation, reservations in employment to protect uh, the weaker groups in society, to provide authentic political representatives for these groups, and to provide some hope uh, for overcoming the legacy of um, discrimination, uh, as well as dealing with majoritarianism on the part of the majority Hindu community. And on the other hand, you had many of the senior uh, Congress leaders, uh, Nehru and Gandhi, who were deeply suspicious of any kind of group uh, policies like this because they saw them very much as a product of British divide and rule policies that would divide Indians from each other and break up the nationalist uh, campaign. They saw these policies as designed to break up the nationalist campaign. So there's a big and fierce debate, uh, especially in the 1930s after the British issued a communal uh, award um, in, in politics that created a major point of conflict between Dr. Ambedkar and Gandhi at that time. But this represents a larger um, philosophical as well as practical debate that still goes on in many countries today about whether the best way to deal with discrimination and issues of group representation is with group specific policies or with more neutral uh, policies and whether in fact it's possible to have neutrality given the overhang of history and uh, discrimination towards different groups. So this was going on to this time in India. Um, the major defender of uh, the group specific uh, policies in India was the Muslim League. And in 1947, at the partition of India, most of the Muslim League's senior leadership went to Pakistan. And that took the wind out of the sails of those who represented a more group-specific idea of how to deal with inequality and issues of representation in India. And it left the Sikhs and the Christians and the Parsis and the Anglo-Indians and the other smaller groups um, that had uh, agreed with the Muslim League on the need for these group-specific policies, really without a strong uh, spokesman uh, in, in New Delhi to push that particular policy. And being associated with group representation uh, became seen as being something uh, that had led to the partition, uh, the violence of the partition period, something that was really in bad odor in 1947 and 1948. So what happened on the ground from 1947 to 49 was a large-scale dismantling of many of these group-specific job reservations, political reservations that had existed prior to that point. But even at this time, in the Constituent Assembly in New Delhi, which you see on the left, um, there are still voices uh, being raised saying that if you do away with group policies altogether, maybe this will just lead to the re-establishment of upper caste hegemony uh, in India. And here you have this, uh, this member. There's a motion on the floor in this particular debate where somebody's saying, let's get rid of all government labels of caste, religion in politics and move forward into a brave new colorblind society. And somebody else is saying, well, if we do that, maybe you'll just uh, end up with a situation in which upper caste hegemony is maintained. And of course, I think that you were too pure of heart to ever possibly have this as a motivation, but maybe other people uh, will have this as a motivation. And neutrality is really a sign of not caring about true equality of opportunity because we need to have group-specific policies in, a, in order to overcome this. The 1950 constitution uh, that was introduced in January 1950 really reflected the Nehruvian view uh, it was a triumph for a more neutral view uh, that said, 
let's do away with discrimination overtly rather than let's have a return to the group specific policies that existed under uh, British rule. And I just list several of the major uh, articles here in the Constitution. And then in red down at the bottom, uh, I want to point out that there's one clause in the Constitution uh, in the directive principles, which are meant to be subsidiary in the Indian Constitution to the fundamental rights in Section 3. This one clause says, well, of course, we've got um, equality of opportunity and non-discrimination in these fundamental principles up above, but down below, we say the state still has an interest in promoting the, uh, the particular interests of uh, the weaker sections of the people, and in particular, of the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes, and shall protect them from various forms of discrimination. And a lot of Indian politics, not just in the 1950s, but today, is about the tension between these two different views of what to do about the weaker sections. Uh, are we to go with an equal treatment, uh, non-discrimination view, or are we to think of group-specific policies? Uh, and this is a tension that very rapidly came to the fore in India in the early 1950s in a case that's often, uh, I think, now forgotten, uh, but I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about it because I think it's important as a view to how people are thinking uh, even today. Uh, so there's a major policy reversal uh, in 1950, 1951, within a couple of years of the Constitution being promulgated in January. And this is because in the south of India, in the state of Madras, uh, it was very unusual because the lower caste had won political power there even in the 1920s. The, the, the backward classes had won power in the 1920s. And they had established in government educational institutions as well as in government employment in the civil service, rules that said out of every 14 uh, employees, 10 or so would have to be from uh, lower caste uh, groups. And only a couple could be Brahmins who traditionally up until the 1920s dominated higher education and dominated the civil service in uh, the province of Madras. And so after the constitution comes in, in January 1950, uh, a couple of unsuccessful uh, Brahmin applicants for uh, medical college and for um, civil service uh, appeal to the Madras High Court on the grounds that uh, they have been unfairly eliminated from consideration uh, to medical school and to the civil service because they scored much higher points than people who got in under the other quotas, uh, but were restricted from getting ambition on the grounds that they were uh, Brahmin. So they won in April 1950 in the Madras uh, court, and then it, the case went all the way up to the Supreme Court of India. And the Supreme Court of India the following year announced that yes, indeed, this was a violation of the Constitution. Uh, and this presents Congress at the time not just with uh, a moral issue, about a philosophical issue, about what kind of a state they want to have and how much they're prepared to defend it. It also prevent, uh, presents them with a very serious political issue because the first ever general elections are likely to be held in Madras just at the end of 1951 and the beginning of 1952. And uh, anybody who can uh, count knows that the lower caste who benefit from the large-scale reservations are the largest share of the electorate in Madras, and Congress is on a hiding to nothing if it doesn't do anything about this as a practical issue. So Congress decides uh, to pass the first amendment to the Constitution, uh, Amendment 1, that says that nothing in the anti-discrimination clauses that I just showed you before uh, should prevent government from doing anything uh, to help the backward classes. So this is the beginning of the modern uh, reservations that we see in India today, in education, the civil service, and elsewhere. This political decision in 1951, uh, with an impending election in the South that Congress is worried about losing, propels Congress to say, OK, we'll accept reservations, even though this isn't really Nehru's view of uh, what should be the, uh, the means of dealing with inequality uh, in India. They basically are forced through uh, political reasons in uh, choosing this as a strategy. 
1951 established this precedent that who benefits from reservations um, is as much about political clout and upcoming elections as disadvantage. So on the left here, this is just a protest from within the past uh, year. This is a relatively well-off community called uh, Jats uh, in uh, Western India and in Haryana who blocked the main uh, canals taking water into uh, New Delhi in order to petition that they too should be backward, even though by many objective standards in the particular state that they're in, they would not be considered uh, as being uh, backward. They won the fight. Uh, politically, it's now locked up in the courts at the moment uh, with review. But politicians of various stripes, as well as group leaders, have used political clout or have offered the carrots of inducements in order to try and uh, get their groups selected as reservations and block others from reservation. This creates a problem if we're thinking about equality because you don't have the ideal targeting that you might like of those who are the most truly disadvantaged in a kind of system where it's very much a transaction for political reasons, who gets in and who gets out in the system. Um, since 1950, um, India has, I think, used four main um, mechanisms, four main techniques to try and bring about that promise of equality that Nehru talked about in um, 1947. Uh, one is through an extension of uh, reservations from initially very small groups of the population to ever larger shares of the population, although constitutionally blocked at 50 of 49.5%, although Tamil Nadu seems to ignore that, uh, there it's around 69%. Uh, um, and also extending reservations to more and more aspects of government employment and education. Uh, so that's been one big lever in which the state has tried to deal with uh, inequality. Another one is through massive uh, social spending, education, health, and centrally sponsored schemes where the center provides most or all of the money for large-scale welfare or employment schemes like this one that you see on the right. Uh, but um, the states uh, have to administer the schemes because India is a federal state and many of the things that matter most for uh, development, like education, are really under the control of the states. So India spends 40 billion US plus uh, in a year on these centrally sponsored schemes, but a lot of the actual delivery uh, quality of these schemes depends on the very variable quality of the individual state machineries that they work through, and I'm going to be coming back to that in a little while. Uh, the third kind of thing that they've done is uh, various job protections for market segments that they think are especially weak or vulnerable to various kinds of competition, as well as large-scale subsidies of food, kerosene, various other things. Um, the Indian government's own surveys show that many of these are very badly targeted. And uh, I could tell stories, and I'm sure other people could in the audience, of uh, many non-deserving people and their ration cards and exactly how they've been able to get their stores of fuel or rice or whatever else uh, through these kind of subsidy schemes. Um, and then the fourth thing, and this is especially since 1991, is a huge opening up of the Indian economy with market reforms and the uh, job growth that's happened in the wake of that. And according to various studies that have been done by the World Bank this year, the bulk of the improvement in recent poverty uh, figures over the past decade has been due not to uh, the subsidies or these other programs, but really to a market-led expansion in overall job growth. That's led to a lot of the recent uh, improvements in India. So uh, just some facts and figures now if we're trying to think about how has India done. So uh, first of all, what's the percentage um, who are below the poverty line? I should say, of course, that poverty lines are quite controversial. Who sets them? Uh, how exactly do we calculate what the poverty line is? If you're asking people based on their consumption, how well can people remember what they consumed uh, today, yesterday, last week? So there are all kinds of methodological issues in figuring out what exactly is a poverty line. But according to uh, the World Bank estimates, which are in turn based upon Indian government estimates, uh, over the past decade or so, uh, past 20 years of, or so, sorry, um, you've seen a reduction, a very substantial reduction of the numbers below the poverty line in India from 45% to 
Uh, roughly 80% of uh, India's poor are in the villages. People who move to urban areas improve their situation. Uh, we may think that they're doing badly, but compared to the areas that they have come from, they are doing much, much better, and the cities are a real avenue of opportunity. Uh, in terms of literacy, uh, India has done not as well as China or South Korea or some other countries that started at the same point, but in South Asian terms, India has done uh, much better than its neighbor, uh, Pakistan, in raising its literacy levels, as you see here, from 1960s um, to uh, 2011. It's also done better in terms of infant mortality. Uh, you could go through a whole range of statistics and show that India has done better, although it started at a somewhat higher level than its neighbor, uh, Pakistan, even in um, periods when Pakistan had somewhat higher overall economic growth levels than India did. Um, another way to think about how India has done is more qualitatively, how happy are people with their democracy? Do they feel that they have an equal shake in the country? And I just put this um, figure here down at the bottom. Um, the CSDS did a survey in uh, the mid-2000s where they surveyed people all across uh, South Asia, and they found that minorities in India were much happier with their democracy than minorities living elsewhere in the region. And very interestingly, this didn't seem to differ an enormous amount across the different minorities uh, within India. Um, that Muslims, Christians, Sikhs all felt, yes, democracy has problems, but we're satisfied overall with our democratic uh, situation. And you had much stronger majorities in favor of recognizing minority rights within India than you did in nearby Pakistan as well. So that's that's some of the good news. Another uh, thing I think that's very important to recognize is that the reservations, though of course they may have their problem in terms of targeting, have led to the emergence of a scheduled caste and to a lesser extent a, a, a backward class, middle class. On back, lesser extent with regard to the backward class because they had more of a middle class to begin with and they suffered from fewer of the biases that the scheduled caste faced. So Ms. Mayavati, up at the uh, top left here, she is an affirmative action child, the child of somebody who got reservations in the same way actually as Ambedkar uh, himself was an affirmative action child at a time when the army was still employing members of his community in a regiment before it was disbanded. Um, you've seen the growth of what Christoph Jaffelow calls the silent revolution, the growth of lower caste and backward caste politicians uh, who were originally very important in the south of India, and the big trend of the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s in India is that these politicians uh, came to power in the north as well and the west and started introducing many of the same reservation policies that previously they had had in the south. And you've also seen the extension in local government in the past few years of um, reservation policies that mandate a particular level of representation for backward caste. And here you have this quote from uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Simon Chauchard, who interviewed uh, Dalits who benefited from these reservations, saying that now we smell like jasmine. People used to you know, shun us, but uh, now they actually are forced to speak to us. It may not change their hearts, it may not change their views, but it changed their actions. And from actions ultimately may come changed minds. That's the good news. So what's the bad news? Well, there's really unacceptably slow progress and even some reversal in some areas. So the female labor force participation uh, rate, as far as we can work out, has gone down over the past decade, partly because uh, the market isn't raising uh, female job opportunities as much as male, partly because of social conservatism, partly because of pre-market discrimination against girls that leaves them less uh, able to compete at the time they're ready to head into the workforce. So that's not good news. Uh, although the numbers have gone down and the government currently has made it a priority, 44% of Indians uh, still have to go to the bathroom in the open. All right. um, very large numbers without piped water, uh, a large number of children under five with stunted growth, there are also enormous differences in India in poverty in terms of state and region. Um, this is probably too small for those people to see at the back, but the basic message is that in some states you have uh, rural poverty ratios amongst um, scheduled tribes and scheduled castes and others, 
in the 10 to 20 percent range. And in the worst states like Bihar, you have uh, in the 45 to 70 percent range uh, rural poverty. So there are enormous differences uh, across groups with scheduled castes and scheduled tribes doing the worst, but also across states. So if you run regression models, as some economists have done, to try and work out what are some of the biggest predictors of uh, poverty in India, which state you're born in is one of the biggest ones. All right? That has an enormous effect on how you do, even holding everything else uh, constant. There are also very big differences in terms of religion. So Muslims who live in towns are 27% poorer than average uh, urban uh, Indians. Uh, Muslims have much less access to education uh, than uh, Hindus, uh, Christians, and Sikhs. And actually, Muslims um, are getting, things aren't getting better for Muslims relative to scheduled caste. So the Sachar Commission, which is a big commission in the mid-2000s that gathered lots of data on how Muslims were doing, found that the lowest age groups amongst Muslims were for the first time in post-independence India doing worse than the Dalit community, right? So they don't have the political clout, the access to reservations that other communities uh, do, and they're paying a cost for that. They're also paying costs for other reasons I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, Muslims are overrepresented, just to dig a little bit deeper in these data, in low-paid and unpredictable occupations. So one thing I've been doing is taking uh, national sample survey data from India in the past few weeks and uh, crunching the numbers a bit to try and work out which communities are overrepresented or underrepresented in different occupations. And as we see with Muslims, they're very overrepresented in unstable and low-paid occupations like garbage pickers, the people who live on garbage sites or work in the recycling uh, industries, in day laborers, in market gardener kinds of things, but they are very under they are very underrepresented in professional occupations, in management occupations, in government occupations. If I was to show you the flip side of this chart, um, they're very underrepresented. Scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, lower castes are underrepresented as well. Um, so it's a real problem. If you're going to solve poverty in India, bring about two in. Um, equality, you're going to need to tackle these groups, and these groups are very underrepresented in, um, in many sectors of the economy. Uh, here's just some data on caste. Uh, this is the likelihood that you'll be in different kinds of employment by scheduled tribe, scheduled caste, other backward caste, upper Hindus, upper Muslims. One thing that comes through here is that uh, upper Hindus are very overrepresented in regular workers, which means the formal sector of the economy, the highly regulated sector of the economy with better pay and conditions relative to scheduled tribes and scheduled castes. And scheduled tribes, scheduled castes uh, are much more represented amongst casual laborers, people who have no real security of, um, of jobs and also very low incomes. And that, that gives you some sense of how caste intersects with religion in explaining this. Um, there are also some government departments that are still extremely resistant to diversification. So I've just finished a book in the army, so I couldn't resist sort of giving you a little bit of uh, army research uh, here. This map on the left shows you where ex-servicemen live in India. The Indian state does not release data on district recruitment of, um, of soldiers, but it did release pension data. And so what I did was I... Um, I found all the pension data and then matched it to individual districts and tried to work out proportionally um, where the soldiers were. And as you can see, army recruitment, of course, is a lagging uh, variable. This is about 20 years old because these people are now uh, retired. The people are still recruited overwhelmingly from the Punjab, from uh, some Maratha areas uh, near Bombay, uh, from areas that provided the bulk of the colonial army in the 1940s. Uh, in a very recognizable kind of way. So there's been much less change than we would think in army recruitment patterns. And just one instance of this, this is the president's bodyguard on the left outside the presidential mansion in New Delhi. So to be a member of the president's bodyguard today in India, you need to be either a Sikh Jat, a Rajput, um, or uh, a Jat. Uh, and members of specified caste groups. So in a way, the representative body for 
the secular state of India, you need to be a member of a specific caste to be employed in the president's bodyguard. That's a hangover in many respects from the colonial recruitment policies. Uh, Muslims uh, are also not employed in the intelligence wing. There's an effective ban on them in the intelligence wing, which is called RAW. Um, so why? Let's uh, think about three or four reasons for why more progress hasn't been made in terms of poverty and equality in India. And I'll go through that now, and then uh, we can have some Q&A. So one big reason is that the government-regulated sector, which all the talk about reservations refers to, is a really small part of the overall pie that you actually need to solve if you're going to do anything significant about uh, inequality in India. It's only 8% of all jobs. And it's the size of the sector that hasn't really budged much in the past 20 years. Because of the very high level of regulation, companies uh, will do anything they can to try and avoid um, adding more jobs in these sectors. So the sectors that offer the best benefits aren't growing that much. To the extent they're growing, they're growing through government employment. And a lot of minorities and a lot of lower castes are uh, heavily represented in the informal market segments that have the least protection uh, for workers and offer the least um, good conditions and pay. And I just give you some statistics at the side on Muslim urban male workers uh, compared to Hindu males and Hindu females to give you some sense of the overrepresentation of Muslims in uh, these um, informal markets. Uh, secondly, there's still an enormous amount of market discrimination in India. So there's a very interesting study that was done uh, by Torat, uh, Atwal, and Rizvi in 2006. And what they did was uh, send out testers uh, or uh, matched resumes in response to job applications in a way that's been done to study discrimination elsewhere in the world. So you have one Muslim applicant name, you have one uh, upper caste Hindu applicant name, and you have one scheduled caste applicant name that are stereotypically representative of each of the groups, and then you match them so that they all have a degree from University of Delhi that's exactly the same, and all have bio data, as they would say, that exactly similar. So what that study found, even in the most modern sector of the economy in New Delhi, in English language press, uh, where you might expect uh, some of the prejudice levels to be somewhat less than you would see elsewhere, uh, is that um, scheduled castes have only a two-third likelihood of being called back as frequently as uh, upper caste Hindus. And Muslims have a one-third probability of being called back. Uh, when they send in these initial applications. There are very, very high levels of prejudice in the marketplace against them. Um, that reflects larger prejudices against the poor and against uh, lower caste. Uh, there was also a very interesting study done by Madeshwaran where he tried to have kids... Um, um, oh, sorry, I'm thinking of the Rao study. The Madeshwaran one uh, looked at wage differentials between scheduled castes and other communities. Uh, and what he found is that there are very large and systematic differences in wage differentials given particular skill levels in India, and he estimated that about two-thirds of that was due to different endowments that people uh, had on the market, different levels of education, things like this, which of course could also be a consequence of caste bias, and around one-third was due to strict market discrimination where people just weren't hiring you even if you were qualified because of your particular caste profile on the market. There is still no equivalent in India of national fair housing, employment laws, governing private and informal markets. So if you look at the cable TV shows in Delhi, you will often uh, come across reports where uh, single women uh, aren't able to get accommodation because their residential area says we're not having single women, where kids from the Northeast aren't able to get uh, residences because they are from the wrong group, where Muslims and other groups aren't able to get residences because of massive discrimination in the housing uh, market. And there's been another one of these uh, correspondence tests where people actually sent out testers in the field to try and look uh, in this. And this chart on the right describes uh, that study, which is done by Torah, Banerjee, Misra, and Rizvi. And what they find, if, if you're an upper caste Hindu, then you're you're fine, you are the norm, you are what the renter is looking for in terms of the housing market. But if you are a Dalit, then around 40% of the time, you either are refused or you're accepted, but with different conditions. 
than other people on the market. And if you're a Muslim, you are even worse off. 65% of the time, you're either excluded from consideration in the housing market or else you're accepted but given different and more expensive uh, terms on the housing market. So these, these are very good experimental evidence, I think, for the kind of discrimination that you see in the urban uh, housing and employment markets in India. The third kind of problem that you see is what economists call pre-market uh, inequalities, which is to say, how can we explain the fact that Muslims have less education, worse health, worse other kinds of things going on before they get to the market? How can we explain the fact that scheduled castes have lower endowments by the time they get to the educational market? This is what they call pre-market inequalities. Uh, so Myron Wiener wrote a very good book in 1990 talking about the fact that um, in many states, the people in charge of the education ministry seem to assume that Dalit children, other middle and lower caste children, uh, weren't really into education. Their families didn't really have a good justification for education. Education wasn't for them. And then they provided the level of education that they thought was appropriate, uh, given the particular demand uh, profile that they assumed existed amongst these communities. So there's a lot of caste bias in the provision of education. There's also, and you can see this in silly places. Um, this study that Gautam Rao did in 2013 tried to measure in an experimental way um, whether upper caste children would mix with lower caste uh, poor children and uh, what price they were willing to pay to do this. So what he did was he, he had races where lower caste and upper caste, uh, sorry, where poor and rich children would first race to see who was the fastest and then he would try and match them and see whether they were willing to be paired off with each other. And this is an environment where they knew who was the fastest. And there was some prize that was available, a cash prize, if you would match up with somebody uh, who was really fast. And he found that actually uh, richer kids were willing to uh, forgo quite large amounts of money in order to be matched up with somebody from the same group, even where it was obvious that the uh, poorer kid would have been a much faster um, uh, companion uh, and would have helped you win, uh, win the prize at the end. So he, f he was able to measure, if you like, people's uh, taste for discrimination, I suppose is what the economists would call it. Um, excluded groups also lack uh, uh, what sociologists and anthropologists and geographers call cultural capital. So Craig's done a very nice book uh, on how lower caste um, uh, students in Western UP are able to extract very different things from uh, the bad education they are able to get from Merritt College and other colleges in Western UP compared with kids uh, who have substantially more education and social networks and various ways they can turn this credential into something of worth. So economists uh, and people in other disciplines have found that there, there are very strong relationships between the social networks in which we're embedded and the extent to which we can turn our credentials and our training into usable goods that can actually help us get jobs at the end of the day. And that's something that, again, disadvantages people who are uh, lower caste, Muslim, um, you know, from various excluded groups in society. And then the fourth and, and final thing I want to talk about is the weakness of the state in India, and especially of individual states. So there are enormous differences in uh, the quality of state capacity across different Indian uh, states that are charged with delivering uh, development goods in India. This is a, a very nice survey that was done by Michael Kramer and all uh, in 2005, looking at teacher absence. So what they did was they sent testers to different schools in India to try and find whether the teachers whose names were on the books, on the rosters, were actually in the school. No, this was not to find out whether they were in the classroom teaching. This is to find out whether they could be found anywhere on the school premises on any particular day. So this is surely an underestimate of uh, the, the extent to which these inequalities exist. And as you can see in states like Bihar and Punjab and Assam at the high end, you have a third of teachers who cannot be found uh, anywhere in the school on any particular day. It's a real challenge for the Indian state in a highly regulated environment, how you can make highly unionized, highly protected people who can also make quite a lot of money from private teaching and coaching outside turn up to provide the education on any particular day. And when very low income Indians are paying for private schools, what they're paying for, the research suggests, is not so much better quality teachers as teachers that are more committed and turn up. And that's something that isn't really present in 
um, in the government schools. Um, you could also look at things like uh, the quality of food distribution and the targeted public distribution uh, schemes. So the Indian state itself has estimated that it costs around uh, 3.65 rupees to transfer one rupee of food to the Indian uh, public. There are estimates that in the centrally sponsored schemes, if you took all of that money and you just wrote people a check rather than delivered it through the inefficient state, you would get every rural Indian out and over the poverty line and get most of urban Indians uh, over and out of the poverty line. But it all has to be delivered through the state that is highly variable and somewhat inefficient in delivering it. There are hopes for what the unique ID and other things might be able to do with that, um, but it's a work in progress. Here, as you see, um, the total food grains leakage in this scheme, this was a national survey that was done by the Planning Commission in the early 2000s, found that at the high end, states like Bihar and Punjab and Madhya Pradesh were wasting uh, 60, 70, 80 percent of the food, uh, which doesn't mean that nobody consumed it. Maybe it went to uh, some upper caste or some person who was ineligible. Maybe it got lost along the way, um, diverted uh, to some other use. But um, the, this is basically the addition of all uh, the, the food that wasn't getting to where it should have uh, got under these particular kinds of schemes. So this gives you some sense of the enormous challenge for the Indian state in general and across particular uh, Indian states in dealing with this. All right, here's um, just final slide and then we'll uh, have a bit of time, I hope, for Q&A. So Dr. Ambedkar um, said um, in, in the final debate in November 1949 uh, that sort of signed and sealed the constitution that was then to come into uh, force the following January. He said that uh, really this is the central issue for India, is dealing with equality in politics and inequality in social and economic life. And we have to remove this contradiction or else the contradiction over time will work at the fabric of Indian democracy itself. So this is really the central challenge still for the Indian uh, state. You have a large number of disenfranchised, marginalized people, fewer than you have had at one time, but in a social media environment with um, uh, people being continually bombarded with information about what their expectations should be and what other people are getting. Maybe this hurts more in some way than it did in the past when you see your own inequality as opposed to other people. Uh, there's a dichotomy among scholars in talking about whether the state versus the market can solve this problem. Uh, there's been a recent debate, uh, for instance, between Amartya Sen and Jean Drez. Uh, on the one hand, and Jagdish Bhagwati and Arvind uh, Panagaliya on the uh, other, over essentially whether state on the one hand or market on the other hand is the answer. As I look at this data on inequality, what strikes me is that market in the past decade has done a fantastic job in dealing with the overall issue of, um, of job growth and has made a big contribution to poverty that way. But it's also very clear to me that it doesn't do very much at all about discrimination. It doesn't do very much at all about uh, primary uh, education, basic sanitation, roads, public goods provision, especially for these very, very poor segments of the society. And if we are to have a solution uh, overall, then we need some combination of both, and it's impossible to do it with just relying on the market. You also need to focus on the state, its capacities, and its ability to try and deal with the poorest members of society. So why don't I stop there, and um, we got time for Q&A. Thank you, Stephen, for just an incredibly clear and um, incisive overview on the topic. It really was a, a terrific presentation. Thank you so much. I'm talking to Stephen tomorrow in a podcast, so I'm not going to ask any questions, though I've got a whole queue of them I'd love to ask, and open it up immediately to the floor. We've got about 10 minutes, and I'll do my best to, to see who puts up their hands first. So, questions? Yeah. Oh, could you just wait? I should have said, just wait a moment till the um, microphone gets to you, yeah. So a lot of the figures and uh, charts that you presented are quite sort of like old, right? So my question is, what is the implication of Modi's gov government on this issue of inequality? Like any new policy initiatives and that, is he determined yeah. to combat this? Because uh, a few days ago, I read about this uh, like global poverty index mm -hmm. and Indian was ranked like 98 out of 118 country or something like that mm -hmm. in terms of... Uh, 
uh, the effort to to reduce uh, child poverty and things uh, things mm -hmm. like that, hunger actually. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, uh, what is the implication of Modi's policies and uh, the government on this issue? Thank you. Yeah, well, one, one is to keep the market reforms going. Uh, a second one is uh, to try and improve the efficiency of the state in delivering uh, development and the way in which it carries out development programs. So one important aspect in that is that he didn't, uh, even though the BJP had said it would, uh, uh, reverse and go back on the unique ID program which holds the promise of being able to pay people much more efficiently than if you pay it through the state in which the state's agents take their piece at each way on the way down, right? So this is a, this is a quite important uh, thing because essentially he's choosing efficiency over uh, the previous ideological statement. The state has also uh, reduced the number of centrally sponsored schemes. India has enormous and unnecessary duplication in these CSSs. And the reason is because politicians have used them as kind of vanity projects in which, uh, you know, if you're a member of the Gandhi family, everybody has their own CSS named after anybody who's been connected with them. Uh, and then other parties as well have introduced on the state or the central level a lot of duplication in these schemes, which are always introduced at the time of the election and then go away subsequently. And there's been some attempt at rationalizing that. But the problem is, as I've tried to say, that ultimately a lot is still dependent on the quality of these state governments. And that's highly variable. And unless you can deal with the very poorest states in India and somehow improve their capacity, the ability of the center to do stuff is going to be quite limited. Thanks, Stephen. There's a question here and then at the front. Yeah. Thank you very much, Steve. Wonderful talk. Uh, talk about different kinds of inequality in different spheres. The one thing that didn't really hear you talking about is about gender. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we know the some effects through the reservation policy at, at the you know, village council levels and so on. Do you have anything more to uh, talk about gender-based inequality and so on? Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's a big issue. I've got colleagues like Riko Bhavnani uh, and other, and Esther Duflo has done a lot of, of work on this. Um, it's, it's more because I'm uh, lacking an expertise on gender specifically than because I don't think it's, uh, it's a very important issue. One thing I will say is that uh, a lot of the studies that have uh, been done that are looking, for instance, on increasing reservations for women in politics and how that affects their subsequent ability to win or the amount of money that's being spent on public goods are over relatively small uh, snapshot time periods. So as a consumer of some of that literature, when I read it, I see um, relatively short term effects. And I, I think the jury is still out on some of this stuff in terms of its longer term effects, especially given the conservatism of society uh, at large to, to make more of an impact uh, on, on, on politics. Uh, this was a wonderful talk. And I just wanted to ask you one thing. Has any research done on mental slavery in domestic life, you know, like household slavery? Mm in India, like a whole yeah. lot of middle class, probably 200 million people, each yeah. one has got a servant. And they've been sort of, it has got mental slavery. I mean, they can't get up, and do things. Is yeah. there any research done on that? So there aren't larger systematic studies that I'm aware of. Craig, you may know, you may know of some of them. I mean, I've, I've seen some of the, the difficulties firsthand, just living in like a block of flats in Delhi with a Jogi Jompri, a, a slum area next door. And the woman downstairs from whom I took food was trying to educate the kids from the nearby uh, slum. And she got, she got hell from the neighbors, let me tell you, that why are you bringing these people in as, as humans rather than as a labor force in order to try and educate them in, in the block of flats? There's enormous caste prejudice and social prejudice uh, against these kids that gets in the way of social programs. Question back, yes. Hi, um, I'm about to embark on some, a study about RTE and, mm. or the RTE Act, and um, particularly um, the section uh, requiring the quotas for um, the weaker sections. And I understand that the, which is where, for, in private schools have to 
um, enrol at least 25% from the weaker mm -hmm. sections. And I understand that a lot of the, school, pri the private schools are uh, resisting that, and I'm just wondering if you're able to speak a bit about that. Uh, they are resisting it, and it reflects the fact that it's very unpopular amongst the parents, which reflects some of these larger social prejudices that I talked about, and they will fight it tooth or nail uh, and try and do their best to uh, not meet the requirements. I think what's going to happen is they're going to enroll some of these kids and then discourage them from actually attending. I bet you you're going to see things like that. Right, so they're on the books, they satisfy the criteria, but they're not actually turning up. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, given your overview and the very many indicators you've looked at, um, what's your take on trends in the uh, Nakshalite movement? Uh, five or ten years ago, we were hearing that perhaps a third of Indian districts mm were under the influence of the Nakshal movement, which also increasingly is recruiting women mm -hmm. rather than men. I'm curious as to how you read uh, the trends that you're, f that you're coming across in your own work. So, um, I, I paid some attention to this when I had a, a, a student um, who was doing uh, a, a PhD on the, on the Nakshal movement uh, and, and data quality issues. And one of my worries, just in, in response to your question about the trends and the data, is that a lot of the data aren't very good. Um, so the central government provides quite a lot of assistance and subsidy for you if you have a natural problem. So you can see the problem. So, so if you have problems or if you have high levels of violence, it's in your advantage if you're a state government or perhaps if you're uh, head of a police station uh, to say that you have a natural problem. Um, so I, I, I worry sometimes about whether the data that show the overall trends reflects real issues or reflect the incentives uh, to present issues as being one thing rather than another. There's, you could say this about whole um, large swathes of Indian crime and violence data. So what I'd ideally like is something that triangulates with local press sources and other sources that I think might be a useful check on these government data that we think have some problems. And there are one or two efforts uh, underway in the US and elsewhere at the moment to try and do just that. And I think once those are done, we're going to have better sense on what the actual trends are. But for the moment, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about saying that I'm confident I know what the trends are. I think a last question at, at the back there, then I'm afraid we'll have to stop. Yeah. Hello, my name's Natalie Ralph. I'm from the Alfred Deakin Institute at Deakin University. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, it was extremely interesting in an area that I am very new to. Um, I am, uh, like this lady here, just starting a new study um, focused on India. Normally I look at um, the role of mining and mm. corporate social responsibility and how business uh, can address poverty issues, etc., in different countries. Yeah? Um, I'm wondering if you know anything about um, corporate social responsibility issues in India, particularly because India, I think, is still the only country that has a 2% um, tax on its corporations, mm. which companies have to put towards poverty reduction, etc., etc. Do you know anything about that and if it's had much of an impact? And I'd also like to say, while I've got the microphone, if I may, um, if anyone here is working, uh, looking at India in terms of uh, the market and corporate social responsibility and mining issues, please come over and say hello because I'm just breaking into this area. Thank you. So I, you know, to be honest, I just don't know anything. Uh, literally nothing <laughs> about Indian corporate responsibility policies. I, I do know a little bit about the mining sector um, because I, I went to Orissa a few years ago. I was interested in some of the turnaround stories that were being done about Orissa and Bihar at that time as being states that where pro-development ministers had been re-elected time after time. And so I went to Orissa with bright, bushy-eyed hopes that it was going to be an inspiring uh, story. And I, I came away a little bit more jaundiced, thinking that this was a state in which many people seemed to be making lots of money off the mining uh, industry in, in, in politics. But they were also doing some good government thing. And I think that's a sort of interesting uh, 
aspect about Indian politics that it's not as if politicians are just all corrupt or all good. Many politicians want to construct uh, a coalition that will win. And as more Indian voters care about development and uh, an end to corruption, that will become a more important part of the kind of coalitions that they put together. It doesn't mean they're going to become clean overnight or ignore more traditional money politics or caste politics, but it does make uh, for a more inspiring future than, than, um, than the past. I'm afraid we are going to have to stop, sadly. And uh, I wanted to, to emphasize again um, the, the incredible interdisciplinary contribution that Stephen Wilkinson is making to South Asian studies, because Stephen is not only an extremely gifted political scientist in the sort of classic sense of someone with a, a, an, an exceptional grasp over the sort of quantitative and methodological skills that allow you to rise within that discipline in the States, but also someone who's deeply committed to place and to India. He speaks Hindi, he has this synoptic knowledge of social, economic, political dynamics in the country and really models for us very nicely how one can combine, I think, a disciplinary excellence with uh, and uh, uh, this commitment to, to, to South Asia and to, to the region. So it's been a, a real delight listening to you this evening, Stephen. Thank you very much for taking the time to come. <laughs> <laughs>